<clears throat> Bow with me in prayer, by the way. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that everything that we have done has given you pleasure. That you have seen us observe the Lord's Supper from the depths of our hearts and how much we appreciate what you have done for us. We realize, Heavenly Father, the best person that has ever lived outside of Jesus Christ still was a sinner and need that sacrifice. And we realize that just by our own goodness, we cannot make it because there's so much that we do that is wrong. And we're just so thankful, dear Lord, that your grace covers all that. Father, we are physical human beings, and you have provided the satisfaction of those physical needs, and we thank you for that. And we're just so thankful, dear God, that we might have the right perspective and the right priorities with regard to those things. And Father, we pray that we will avoid the constant struggle of, of, of losing balance, perspective, equilibrium. We know, Heavenly Father, that so often the physical takes precedent because it seems to cry out the loud, loudest sometimes. But we pray, dear Lord, that we would recognize that you'll provide for us those things that we need and that we must endeavor to pursue the spiritual as well as the physical uh, satisfaction in life. That you have placed within us a soul that longs to have fellowship with you. And we pray, dear Lord, that we would recognize your presence in our lives, in the choices that we make. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When God created a human being, he created a physical being as well as a spiritual one. And so often the translations kind of have... Um, diminish that concept, the expression, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Well, that is an identical expression as a living creature that refers to all the other animals. And so our bodies are like all the other living animals. It's like engines that we cannot run without fuel, and so we have to have food. And so food is essential to survive. And if it is true that man shall not live by bread alone, it is also true that man must, live, must have bread to live. And so, as Matthew Henry wrote, because our natural being is necessary to our spiritual well-being in this world, therefore, after the things of God's glory, kingdom, and will, we pray for the necessary support and comforts of this present life which are the gifts of God and must be asked for of him and so in consideration of this particular petition in the Lord's Prayer Lord give us this day our daily bread I notice that each word in this request is highly significant and so I'm going to spend some time talking about each one of those words we are told to ask for bread it is equally beneficial to notice that he did not tell us to ask for luxuries. He did not ask us to, uh, to have wealth. He didn't ask us uh, to ask for dessert, although that's kind of nice, as it was yesterday. And, you know, we don't dare ask for a, a multitude of things, Bread is the staple of life. And so he says, be content with that. Having food and clothing, Jesus says in chapter 6, we will therewith be content. Now, actually Paul said that. And so he's helping us to understand 
that our physical needs might be met and that our prayers should not foster gluttony. And when we pray for things that we don't need, it, it, it just accentuates a dissatisfaction with life. And so often when we pray for things that are not needs but desires, we confuse our needs and desires. Research has been made to compare what people consider to be needs in the 1800s and needs uh, today. And it's amazing how the needs have increased from those in the 1800s as to now. But when you really think about it, needs do not change, desires do. We think that we need things when people in the 1800s got along fine without what we think are needs today. And so, so often we forget the lesson of asking for our daily bread and expect God to give us the abundance of things that are not needs. And so when we think about this subject, it teaches us sobriety and moderation in all things. Every society eats bread. It becomes a staple, a figure of speech for food in general. It's what is nourishing. Now, it all symbolizes it also symbolizes the necessities of life in almost all cultures and, and societies. It teaches us to seek neither poverty nor riches. Proverbs 30 and verse 8 is a good verse. It says, Lord, keep falsehood and lies from me, far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me my own, only my daily bread. And that's what we're talking about today. We are to ask for our bread, our daily bread. And this teaches us honesty. We do not ask God to take food from another and give it to me. Such, Proverbs 20 and 17, is the bread of deceit. We only want what is rightfully ours. If someone takes from others what does not belong to him and argues that God is answering his prayers, he's self-deceived. Some, uh, somebody might say, my prayers are answered when a thief sees an opportune uh, moment of taking what does not belong to him. But when we ask for our daily bread, it's what belongs to us and not what belongs to somebody else. So what does this teach us? This teaches us industry. You know, when you pray for daily bread, do you sit at a table and pray that prayer and pray that God would send manna from heaven and drop on your, uh, on your table and that you can eat and feast on something that you did not work for? Perhaps when we pray for our daily bread, we're actually praying that God would give us an opportunity to earn our bread. Teach us industry and hard work. Truly in Genesis 3.19, from the sweat of your brow, not the sweat of others, are we to eat our bread. And so in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28 it says, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. And 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. And the next expression is we must ask for our daily bread. This warns us about worrying about the future. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The other day I saw a marquee at a church that said something like this. Today is the, is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. I like that. Isn't that the truth? 
We ask for our daily bread and not worry so much about the future. Listen to what James says, James 4, 13 through 14. 4, 13 through 14. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. If any part of the country knows what mist that appears for a while and vanishes away, we do on the coast, do we not? The morning fog is usually gone by the afternoon, and it's surprising how dense that fog can, and quickly it can dis, uh, disappear. Life is like that. David said it was more swifter than a weaver's shuttle. I'd never seen a weaver's shuttle until I visited my sister up in uh, Clear Lake, and they had a um, a um, farmer's market or whatever, and they they had these little booths, and this person was making linen and things like that, and they were using an ancient weaver's shuttle. And I saw all that work, and I said, whoa, that is fast. And then it conveyed to me what David really meant, that life flies by very quickly. So we have to be in industrious and busy today. <clears throat> and furthermore, this helps us to live more than on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, Moses explains the reason why God sent that manna, that miraculous food to the people, and allowed them only to gather enough for that particular day. <clears throat> only on the day before the Sabbath were they allowed <clears throat> to gather twice as much because they couldn't gather on the Sabbath day, the day of rest. And so... If some of them gathered more than they needed, then it would uh, spoil before morning. And so Deuteronomy 8, 3 says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with the manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You remember Jesus quoted that to Satan when he was hungry and Satan tempted him to turn stones into bread. He referred to this passage. And so this whole situation of giving manna and having them only gather enough for one day was to teach them their dependence upon God and that there is more to life than just the physical sustenance of our being. And that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now... Turn with me to John 6, because I think this is an excellent place to add this. This is one of the most fascinating chapters of the whole Gospel of John. Jesus had already fed 5,000 people miraculously, as you recall. And then we find that afterwards, Jesus withdrew... And finally went on the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the west side. And the people noticed that Jesus had left. And so they waited for boats. And they crossed the boat looking for Jesus. Now, I remind you that they had already been fed that day, the 5,000, miraculously. Verse 22, on the next day the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there, was, there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias, that's on the western, northwestern corner, came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. 
So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now they went on the whole other side. They crossed the whole lake to find Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus is saying, you're seeking me for the wrong reasons. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Paul told Timothy that there are people that use godliness as a way of gain. And what he simply means is that they use religion to promote their wealth. Do we know anybody that does this in this country? I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. But there are those that seek Jesus for the wrong reasons. They sought a meal. They saw in Jesus a meal ticket. And there are people that still do that. They use religious groups to get free meals to continue their irresponsible and irresponsible lifestyle. But you know, back then people lived on less than they do today. And their needs obviously were cared for. God promised them godliness with contentment is great gain. First Timothy six and verse six. And so we can talk about the rich fool, but we don't have time. I want to get down here to my next point. We are, at, we are asked to get God to give us our bread. We're to ask him to give it to us. <clears throat> give us this day our daily bread. God is the ultimate source of all things. <clears throat> I heard the story of, of a farmer who was an ungodly man and the wife wanted to pray and give thanks at the table for the food. And he said, don't you dare thank your God for what I provide this family for. God didn't give it to you. I did. Well, that man was a fool. Because that man did not realize that God gave him the ability, the health, the opportunity to be able to provide for his family. That ultimately, James 1 and 17, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So ultimately, God provides material blessings. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 19, Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy with his work, this is also a gift of God. You know, work is not a curse. Some people say, well, because of the fall, man was forced to work. No, he was told to take care of the garden before the fall. Work is a blessing, and we all know it. And so often when men retire, you know, and they don't have other things to do, they die in a few years. <clears throat> because we are created to work regardless. Now, man is helpless in the mighty hand of God. The Lord certainly gives and the Lord can take away. Job's one, Job 1 and verse 21. In Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and cre create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And why would he do that? Why would he withhold blessings from anyone unless that person needs to be taught a lesson. In Hebrews chapter 12, we learn that the Lord is like a father who disciplines his child 
and the child realizes that discipline is not enjoyable, but he knows that if he's a wise child, that his father disciplines him for his own good. Someone once said the, the the worst advantage is to have too many advantages. And we know that we hear about the spoiled rich child who goes out and steals a car when he has a Corvette in the garage kid is really messed up because he hasn't really been taught love and the proper place of values. So man is helpless in the mighty hand of God and that's why we must ask, give us this day our daily bread. You know, we are also told to pray, give us our daily bread and this teaches us not to be self-centered Every man for himself is not a natural trait. It is a corrupt state. The most often used word is I. And the second likened unto it, me. The parable of the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18.11, the Pharisee mentioned I about four times in a short little prayer. I'm glad I'm not like the other guy. I'm glad... I'm glad I do this, and I'm glad that I do that. But the important thing is for us to think about God rather than ourselves. Now, it also teaches us to pray for others. Give us this daily bread. Maybe others may not have been as fortunate as we, and so we give of our means, and we assist others to help others. In 1 John 3 and verse 17, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God abide in him? This teaches us that we should pray together and pray for one another. Give us our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And so a Christian without a fellowship is like an orphan without a home. It's like a child without a friend. We call this our church family for a reason, right? And once you feel a part of the church family, it's hard to even imagine not being a part of the church family. I remember, and I I hope uh, it's okay to share this, Lisa, but at a potluck, I was talking uh, to Tani, and I said, you know, Tani, you drive all the way from the North County, and you come all the way here on Sundays to church. I'm going to tell you that this, I really appreciate what you guys do, because I know how difficult that is. And she says, I wouldn't want to do anything else. This is my church family. It sure touched my heart. And we need to compliment them and show them how much we appreciate the sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. It costs money. It takes a lot of time. Places your life in danger in a road. So we we need to pray for one another and we need to see the value. And I'm going to say this once more. A Christian without a fellowship is like an orphan without a home, a child without a friend. And once you have your Christian family, You never, ever want to give it up. Among our Christian brethren, we find our home. We find a place to belong. And the Lord teaches us to make our requests daily. It's not one prayer and that's it. It's a daily need and it's a daily prayer. And we must make our requests daily to God. In Philippians 4, 6... Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, Paul says, pray all the time. And that, of course, is best defined as daily prayer. Do you have a daily prayer life? If not, you know you're not living up to what God expects you to do. You must have a daily prayer life. 
And if you allow one day to go without a prayer, would you like God to forget you that day? I don't think so. But we shouldn't forget God either. Now, Matthew Henry says, We pray that God would give us this day, which teaches us to renew the desire of our souls toward God, as the wants of our bodies are renewed, as duly as uh, as... As duly as the day comes, we must pray to our Heavenly Father and reckon we could as well go a day without meat as without prayer. I think that says it all. If it takes things to make us happy, our service to God will always be conditionally. If we always put an if, then we are serving God conditionally. If God, if you just do this, I will do this. But God tells us, if you serve me, I will bless you. But you should never have ifs as conditions of our service. Job was told by his wife when he lost everything in his health, Why don't you just curse God and die? And Job says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And it says, Job retained his integrity. He remained true to himself. He remained true to God because that was who he was. There's a lot in this, give us this day, our daily bread, isn't there? We hope that we have been edified, challenged, and encouraged today by the lesson. And we're going to extend the invitation. The water is here for those that need to be baptized. We obviously will ask anyone to come forward to share a prayer need. and uh, Or if you've lived... Uh, not the way you should, and you want to recommit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your opportunity. So come as together we stand and sing if you need to respond.